Well, I'll talk to you a little bit now about the concentration camp. Concentration camps were established, they were established in England, Germany, Russia, China, Cambodia, and Yugoslavia. And in the Soviet Union, the estimates, these are estimates that were derived by Solzhenitsyn, were that 66 million people died in internal repression in the Soviet Union between 1919 and 1959. That's a figure that's ten times as great as the figures that are commonly used to describe the, ge the genocide rate in the Holocaust, which was more like six million. And Solzhenitsyn also estimated, but no one knows, that a hundred million people died in China during Mao's cultural revolution, when Mao decided that he was going to wipe out all of Chinese tradition and destroyed much of the, much of the ancient artifacts that characterized that tradition in, a, in a, like a riotous catastrophe that lasted more than a decade. Solzhenitsyn says, the imagination and strength, spiritual strength of Shakespeare's evildoers stopped short at a dozen corpses because they had no ideology. Ideology. That's what gives evil doing its long sought justification and gives the evildoer the necessary steadfastness and determination. That's the social theory which helps to make his acts seem good instead of bad in his own eyes and others. This was how the agents of the Inquisition fortified their wills by invoking Christianity, the conqueror of foreign lands by extolling the grandeur of their motherland, the colonizers by civilization, the Nazis by race, and the Jacobins early and late by equality, brotherhood, and the happiness of future generations. Without evildoers, there would have been no archipelago. The archipelago, the Gulag archipelago, is Solzhenitsyn's metaphor for the, for the prison camps, like the prison camps that exist now in North Korea in which millions of people are starving and dying for the, for the prison camps that littered the entire Soviet Union and the, the, those cultures became so pathological that in East Germany, for example, before the wall fell down and East Germany was arguably one of the more civilized parts of the Soviet state one person out of three was a government informer so if you have a family of five people there's a reasonable probability that two of them are going to tell a government agent what you say and think and that that was also portrayed as the highest possible moral virtue because it was much better for you to be a admirable citizen of the state than say a loyal daughter and that's what children were taught in school that the family was a defunct unit and that individual relationships were secondary and that all that mattered was adherence to the dogma that constituted the central axioms of the state this is Solzhenitsyn's description of how communist ideological uniformity was enforced in the prison camps. An anonymous author is told how executions were carried out at Adak, a camp on the Pechora River. They would take the opposition members with their things out of the camp compound on a prisoner transport at night, and outside the compound stood the small house of the third section. The condemned men were taken into a room one at a time, and there the camp guards sprang on them. Their mouths were stuffed with something soft, and their arms were bound with cords behind their backs. Then they were led out into the courtyard where harnessed carts were waiting. The bound prisoners were piled on the carts from five to seven at a time and driven off to the Gorka, the camp cemetery. On arrival, they were tipped into big pits that had already been prepared and buried alive. Not out of brutality, no. It had been ascertained that when dragging and lifting them, it was much easier to cope with living people than with corpses. The work went on for many nights at ADAC, and that is how the moral political unity of our party was achieved. If you have a rigid belief system, and that's what an ideology is, because it, its axioms are such that it encompasses all of reality, and then there are details left outside that don't seem to fit into that reality, well, then you ignore them. But what if they're embodied? What if they're people who are objecting to the way you think? Well, the equivalent to repressing evidence that runs contrary to your theory is the murder of people who object to what you say. And those two things are linked much tighter than you would think. You know, you might think, well, I would never do something like the communists did in, 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 in the, what, the, the evangelization of my beliefs. But the truth of the matter is, is that in general, people will do such things if they're granted the opportunity and provided with the proper apparatus.
This is Frankel from his accounts of the concentration camps under Nazi Germany. The most ghastly moment of the 24 hours of camp life was the awakening, when, at a still nocturnal hour, the three shrill blows of a whistle tore us pitilessly from our exhausted sleep and from the longings in our dreams. We then began the tussle with our wet shoes, into which we could scarcely force our feet, which were sore and swollen with edema. And then there were the usual moans and groans about petty troubles, such as the snapping of wires which replaced shoelaces. One morning I heard someone, whom I knew to be brave and dignified, cry like a child, because he finally had to go out to the snowy marching fields in his bare feet, as his shoes were too shrunken for him to wear. In those ghastly moments, I found a little bit of comfort, a small piece of bread, which I drew out of my pocket and munched with absorbed delight. Solzhenitsyn. Many of the gulag camps contained two classes of prisoners. Rapists, murderers and thieves who were very well organized in Russia and the Soviet Union and political prisoners. And because the Soviets believed that the reason that people were thieves, murderers and rapists was because of the appalling sociological conditions that they grew up into, they believed they were socially friendly elements who could still be redeemed. So they put them in charge of the camps. And so the political prisoners were at the bottom of the hierarchy. The prisoners ran the camps with minimal supervision. And the camps were often forced labor camps. And forced labor meant do something difficult and pointless until you die. It didn't mean, it meant only secondarily produce something of potential value to the state. You saw this with Nazi Germany too. The Nazis, when they started to lose the Second World War, they could have stopped their Holocaust machinations and used the people they had imprisoned to build implements to further the war effort, which they did to some degree, so they could have used them as slaves. So this would be the logic. Take the slaves, make the munitions, win the war. Then, after you've won the war, you can run around and mop everybody up. But that isn't what the Nazis did. When they started to lose, instead of doing what you think would be rational in the pursuit of what was hypothetically their goal, they amped up the killing and, and took resources away from the war itself. And so the conclusion that's reasonable to draw from that is that the killing was the purpose of the war. All the rest of it was just window dressing. And exactly as, as Solzhenitsyn described in the earlier quotes that I told you, was the ideology was only there to allow the people who were fundamentally motiv motivated towards genocide and destruction to pretend to themselves that they hadn't become rotten to the absolute core. But when push came to shove and they had to show where their allegiances lie, they weren't even, they weren't even valid followers of the Nazi party. Because they put the continued pursuit of death above their own survival, even as an ideology. And that's how ideology degenerates. And part of the reason for that is that the narrower the box that you stuff yourself into, the weaker your character becomes. Because there's nothing left of you. You're just a shell that has demons in it. And, but you're still the sort of thing that can suffer. And so if you cram everything you are into a, a box, a small tight box, and you get rid of everything that doesn't fit, you get rid of everything in you that makes life bearable. And then life becomes unbearable. And then if life becomes unbearable, well then of course you're motivated to do nothing but to take revenge on it. Because why wouldn't you? Head, they have you pick out some random clothes from a pile of clothes, hopefully they don't fit, and then you're tried, you confess, if you will, and you're off to the prison camp. To say that things were painful for them is to say almost nothing. They were incapable of assimilating such a blow, such a downfall, and from their own people too, from their own dear party, and from all appearances for nothing at all. After all, they had been guilty of nothing as far as the party was concerned, nothing at all. It was painful to them to such a degree that it was considered taboo among them, uncomradely, to ask, what were you imprisoned for? Ha, 
They were the only squeamish generation of prisoners The rest of us, with our tongues hanging out Couldn't wait to tell the story to every chance newcomer we met And to the whole cell, as if it were an anecdote Here's the sort of people they were Olga Sliosberg's husband had already been arrested And they had come to carry out a search and arrest her too The search lasted four hours And she spent those four hours sorting out the minutes of the Congress of the bristle and brush industry Of which she had been the secretary until the previous day The incomplete state of the minutes troubled her more than her children Who she was now leaving forever Even the interrogator conducting the search could not resist telling her Come on now, say farewell to your children Here is the sort of people they were A letter from her 15 year old daughter came to Yelizaveta Tsetkova in the Kazan prison for long term prisoners Mama, tell me, write to me, are you guilty or not? I hope you weren't guilty because then I won't join the Komsomol Which was the young communist organization And I won't forgive them because of you But if you are guilty, I won't write you anymore and I will hate you And the mother was stricken by remorse in her damp, grave-like cell with its dim little lamp How could her daughter live without the Komsomol? How could she be permitted to hate Soviet power? Better that she should hate me, and so she wrote, I am guilty, enter the Komsomol How could it be anything but hard? It was more than the human heart could bear To fall beneath the beloved axe And then to have to justify its wisdom But that's the price a man pays for entrusting his God-given soul to human dogma Even today, any orthodox communist will affirm that Setkova acted correctly Even today, they cannot be convinced that this is precisely Quote, the perversion of small forces That the mother perverted her daughter and harmed her soul Here's the sort of people they were Y.T. gave sincere testimony against her husband Anything to aid the party Oh, how one could pity them If they at least had come to comprehend their former wretchedness This whole chapter could have been written quite differently If today at least they had forsaken their earlier views But it happened the way Maria Danielin had dreamed it would if I leave here someday, I am going to live as if nothing had taken place Loyalty? In our view, it's just plain pig-headedness Those devotees to the theories of development Construed loyalty to that development to mean renunciation to any personal development whatsoever As Nikolai Adamovich Vilenchuk said after serving 17 years We believed in the party, and we were not mistaken Is this loyalty or pig-headedness? No, it was not for show and not out of hypocrisy Hypocrisy that they argued in the cells in defense of all the government's actions They needed ideological arguments in order to hold on to a sense of their own rightness Otherwise insanity was not far off This is from Paradise Lost So, in this scene, Satan is cast into hell And it's because of his rebellion against the transcendent His idea that he himself is sufficient This is his statement to his crew Farewell happy fields Where joy forever dwells Hail horrors Hail infernal world And thou profundest hell Receive thy new possessor One who brings a mind Not to be changed by place or time The mind is its own place And in itself can make a heaven of hell Or hell of heaven What matters where if I be still the same And what I should be All but less than he whom thunder hath made greater Here at least we shall be free The Almighty hath not built here for his envy Will not drive us hence Here we may reign secure And in my choice To reign is worth ambition Though in hell Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven Situation when you got orders which is four, we're wrong. How do you react? When do you start to do something against it? For me, this is very important. We are not talking about aliens. We are talking about people. Um, this photograph, it's, it's very famous. I think most of you will not see it the first time. It's from Soviet Union around 1941-1942. We see a pit with corpses. We see one man who's about to be shot. You cannot tell anything more than he's a man. 
cannot tell if he's Jewish or not. The only way of telling it would be this yellow star. He doesn't carry it, but of course it could be on the coat. It's very likely that he is Jewish because most of those being shot in these uh, mass shootings were Jews. We see one perpetrator with one gun and very many other men. What are those other men doing? They are watching, spectators. They haven't got anything to do with it. In almost all these cases, <coughs> when there were mass shootings, there was a crowd of people, an audience. In this case, only Germans. Very often people from the neighborhood. I mean, anti-Semitism isn't anything specific German. There was a huge anti-Semitism in Ukraine, in eastern parts of Poland, in Lithuania. And there, sometimes just the crowd watched this and were cheering. In this case, only Germans. I do not say this man should have done resistance that very moment. There's nothing I can say. But what I can tell is he knew about it. The others knew about it. And the photographer knew about it. From 1945, in both parts of Germany, there was this myth we didn't know anything about these atrocities. To most of the people, this must have been a lie. Apart from the fact that the crimes didn't start here. I mean, that the people were stigmatized, that they were being pushed out of the society, that there were laws against them, that they were deported. Of course, everybody knew. But even this is something most of the people must have known. Um, this, the research quite new about all those German soldiers who, were, who became prisoners of war by the Brits and um, the US Americans. For those men, the war was over, they were in barracks, and while they were in their barracks, they were being surveilled, of course, without knowing it. The Allies, West Allies, wanted to find out, yeah, should they pass some information? Um, what were they talking about? Women, women, girls, girls, a little bit about technique. Not so much about sports, there wasn't too much sports in, during wartime. And sometimes, of course, they were talking about yeah, what they experienced during wartime. Um, it's an archive in, in Washington nowadays with 150,000 pa pages of paper. 150,000. If it would be the truth that the Germans didn't know anything about it and somebody talks, starts to talk about atrocities, then you would expect two sorts of reactions. The first would be, what? cannot be true. I've never heard of it. The other would be, that is not true. True, that is uh, propaganda by the Allies. Those two reactions you do not find in those 150,000 pages, uh, pages of paper. Not one single case of such a reaction. Um, people are just talking about these atrocities as if it was the most common thing in the world. And for those people, it only reached adult male Jews. That was changed already after six weeks, all of them. Women, children, babies, everything. Um, that was a very long front line from Leningrad almost to the Caspian Sea, more than 2,000 kilometers. And everywhere at the same time, their order was to kill every Jew. So the um, Yes, as was not enough, they needed help. And this help they pretty much got from the war police. It could happen that you were a traffic policeman until 1941, then you applied for a task force. Before they killed the first time, the major was standing in front of his police battalion, telling them what the order would be. Today we kill every single Jewish woman and child in this village, and then he did something very really unexpected. He said, whoever feels not being capable of doing so should take one step forward. Of those 500 policemen, 12 took a step forward. The existentialists of the late 19th century attempted to diagnose the pathology of the human personality 
at a deeper level, I believe, than anyone else had ever attempted and their fundamental conclusion was that the destruction by rationality of the evolved systems of meaning that people had previously lived within had undermined the psychological strength of each individual divorced from their own history that led them to be to gravitate towards either nihilism or as a counterposition to gravitate towards totalitarianism the whole 20th century played out the pendulum swing between nihilism and totalitarianism and in the background the existentialists and the psychodynamic theorists were putting forward a theory which was that if people lived up to their own possibility and held on to their own experience as if it were true and did not substitute for that ideological and consensual beliefs that it would be possible for each person to find a wellspring of meaning that would be a sufficient replacement for what had been lost historically without having to fall into the pitfalls of nihilism or totalitarianism and so you might say well Nihilism, well, that's one thing, because mostly that affects you, although if you're nihilistic, then everyone around you is going to be pulled down as well But totalitarianism is a whole different issue, because what we know now is that once things become ideologically totalitarian, the next step is mass murder And, and it, it's, it, the next step is mass murder in, in a manner that makes it appear that the purpose for the ideological rigidification to begin with was the opportunity to participate in mass murder so you know how Hitler died Hitler lost faith in the German people because they were losing the war and so he concluded in the waning stages of World War II that Germany should just be destroyed in fire and everything else that he could possibly consume would go with him and so he died in a bunker underneath Berlin when it was in flames he committed suicide when Europe was in flames and Hitler was a worshipper of the kind of fire that purifies used that mythology of cleansing fire to to enter into a terrible pact with the with the entire nation that he followed and led and Stalin Stalin just didn't just kill individuals that he pulled off the streets he killed like all the engineers and all the doctors because he believed they were wreckers they killed all the good farmers they killed six million Ukrainians. They moved whole nations of people into Siberia and let them die. And there's every, every bit of evidence there is suggests that what Stalin was doing was practicing murderous genocide on an ever larger scale and hoping that it would culminate in a, a thermonuclear war. And we escaped that just by a thread. The existentialists make the claim, which, which I think is a remarkable and powerful claim, that the way out of those catastrophic situations is not through political action per se, or it's not going to be resolved by one party defeating another, or one position defeating another. That's a continuation of the same process that produces the problem. The existential and the psychodynamic answer to this problem is that it's more a disease of the soul than a disease of the state and that the way to address it is to ensure that you live in a manner that makes you neither nihilistic nor susceptible to ideological possession a little thing called the uh, I do a vlogumentary journal and I basically document I document my journey and I use the documentations as a way to discover what problem it is I'm trying to solve and how to solve it. Solzhenitsyn and, and other, other thinkers like him, like Frankel, believed that, this, that society was a macrocosm of the individual. 
not the other way around, not that the individual is a sub-element of society believed that the choice that each individual made was potentially so powerful in relationship to pathological behavior or, or, honest, or honest and thoughtful behavior that a, a single individual properly developed could stand up against a tyranny and win and it seems to me, and I thought about this for a very long time that the lesson of the 20th century is that a single individual can stand up against a tyrant and win and each of us are single individuals and the danger of tyranny and the danger of nihilism are not past and so as inheritors of the catastrophic legacy of the 20th century and as inhabitants of the new millennium part of your responsibility is to live your own life and to live it honestly and to pay attention to your own experience and not take the easy way out that ideological systems offer you they're destined to transform themselves into rigid and murderous pathologies and you offload your responsibility for thinking and acting to them and then you have to ask yourself, well what are they? Well, all the evidence suggests that they're not the sort of thing that you want to have in you. family, loving aunts, and a good home. No, on the surface I seem to have everything, except my one true friend. All I think about when I'm with friends is having a good time. I can't bring myself to talk about anything but ordinary everyday things. We don't seem to be able to get any closer and that's the problem. Maybe it's my fault that we don't confide in each other. In any case, that's just how things are, and unfortunately, they're not liable to change. This is why I've started the diary. To enhance the image of this long-awaited friend in my imagination, I don't want to jot down the facts in this diary the way most people would do, but I want the diary to be my friend, and I'm going to call this friend Kitty. Since no one would understand a word of my stories to Kitty if I were to plunge right in, I'd better provide a brief sketch of my life, much as I dislike doing so. So let's start with postmodernism. The first thing to understand about the postmodernists are that they are by no means unintelligent. Uh, quite the contrary. Jacques Derrida, for example, and Michel Foucault, for that matter, two famous French public intellectuals who are both at or near the head of what you might describe as the postmodern intellectual revolution, are extraordinarily intellectually capable. Um, that doesn't mean they're correct by any stretch of the imagination, but it, it certainly means that they're more than able to put together a, an argument that's difficult to disentangle. And so we'll start with the, what I think is the most central power, the most powerful central claim of postmodernism, 
a claim which I think is actually correct and which also has bedeviled many other fields, including, surprisingly enough, artificial intelligence. The claim is something like, there is an infinite number of ways to interpret any even finite set of phenomena. And, and, and that actually happens to be true. It's, it's, it's part of the reason why it's been so difficult for human beings to develop artificial intelligence and for them to develop machines that could operate in real-world environments, because it turns out that the world is so complex that perceiving it appears virtually impossible, technically speaking. We heard a little bit earlier the, the previous talk about embodied cognition, and one of the ways psychologists are trying to address the issue of the impossibility of perception is to note that perception isn't possible without situating the mind in a body that has a certain set of constraints. Um, we also devote a tremendous amount of our neurological landscape to, to sensory processing so that when we look at the world it can manifest itself in the self-evident way that it appears to, but that doesn't mean that it's a simple problem, it's a very complicated problem, and the postmodernists were technically correct. There's, there's a, there's a near-infinite number of ways to, to perceive and interpret a finite number of phenomena. Now, you see, the thing that's interesting about that claim, um, apart from the fact that it happens to be technically true, is that you can use it to mount an assault on any interpretation of anything whatsoever, because there is a tremendous vari variability in the number of interpretations that you could bring to bear on a situation, then you can instantly jump to the conclusion or expound the proposition that none of those interpretations should be privileged above all, above any others. Now, that's actually wrong. And this is why postmodernism is correct in its central assumption, but incorrect in its secondary assumption. Now, the reason it's wrong is because although there is a very large number of potential interpretations of the world, that does not mean that there is an equally large number of viable interpretations of the world. Now, you might say, well, what constitutes constraints on the viability of an interpretation? And I would say, well, there, there's a number of them. Um, and I think you have to understand this in the context of living creatures viewing and interpreting the world, and also within a broader evolutionary context. The way that evolution solves the problem of the infinite number of potential interpretations is by killing every single thing that interprets things badly enough to die. Right, and so and I, I mean this, this is actually one of the most powerful arguments for the necessity of the evolutionary, for the necessity of the accuracy of the evolutionary theory. It's, it's that, you know, it's taken three and a half billion years of evolution to produce creatures of our sort who can interpret the world, which is impossible to interpret well enough to live for approximately 80 years and to have some reasonable chance of propagating during that period of time. Three and a half billion years, and that's the best we've been able to do. It's a very complicated problem, and evolution solves that problem by producing a tremendous number of variants and then killing almost all of them. And so death is the solution to the problem of interpretation, and it's a terrible solution, but the point I'm trying to make there is that interpretations are constrained by such things, primary things, that happen to be relevant to living beings, like suffering and death. So those are the first sets of constraints. Your interpretations of the world should shield you to the degree possible from excess suffering and death. It doesn't seem to be too debatable a proposition unless you're aimed in the suicidal direction. And so, so we can start by merely pointing that out. We also might point out that such things as the necessity for cooperating and competing with others also constrains the interpretations that you're allowed in the world, especially given that not only do you have to cooperate and compete with people one time, but that you have to cooperate and compete with often the same people many times in many different contexts, and so that not only do you have to interpret the world so that you can cooperate and compete with those people, you have to do it in a manner that can be iterated and repeated. And that constitutes also an extraordinarily serious constraint. So you don't want to suffer too much, and you don't want to die, and you want to be able to cooperate with people, and you want to be able to compete with them, and you want to be able to do that over long periods of time. And then maybe you also want to do it with an aim in mind, because generally we have aims in mind, and so there are things that we like to have more than other things, and so we aim at those, and then we have to constrain our interpretation so that when we enact them in the world, the probability that what we're aiming at is going to happen will improve. And all of those constraints operates, operate simultaneously. And what that implies, and I think Jean Piaget, the developmental psychologist, maybe went farther along this line of thinking than anyone else I know about anyways, it's sort of an elaboration of Kant's fundamental ethical maxim, which was something like, um, 
act as if the thing that you're doing will be done by everyone. And, but the Piagetian sense was more like act as if the thing that you'll be doing needs to be repeated endlessly in a manner that moves up instead of down. It's something like that. But the point is, is that there's, there's tremendous constraints on the manner in which we can interpret the world from any realistic perspective. So the criticism that there are an infinite number of interpretations falls apart on closer examination. So that's the, that's the first place that the postmodernists are seriously wrong. They radically underestimated the intrinsic constraints on, on, on interpretation. Now, the neck, so that, so, and then the, the central claim of Marxism, and the, Postmodernism and Marxism tend to be aligned, which is a very strange thing, is that the best way to view the world is through the lens of oppressed and oppressor, oppressor and oppressed. Now, the funny thing about that is, if you're a postmodernist, is that that's actually an interpretation, right? It's a Marxist interpretation, and the interpretation is that the best way to look at the world is through the lens of oppressor versus oppressed, but if you're a postmodernist, you don't get to have a canonical interpretation, because your whole damn theory is predicated on the notion that you don't get to have a canonical interpretation, because no interpretation is better than any other interpretation. So then you might ask, well, apart from the fact that the infinite number of interpretations argument is wrong in any practical sense, why in the world would you allow your postmodern deconstructionist philosophy to remain nested in Marxism. So that's the next question, because it certainly is. And if you read Derrida, for example, or Foucault, and if you look at the intellectual history of the postmodern movement, which expanded radic rapidly in the 1970s, you find that it's no secret that the postmodernists emerged out of an, an, an underlying Marxist framework. And never, they didn't abandon, they merely modified it. So it, it went from uh, bourgeoisie against proletariat to, you know, one identity group after, uh, against the other, but it was still oppressor, oppressed narrative, it's just a sleight of hand. So the question is, well why in the world, if you make the central claim that no narrative is to be privileged, why in the world would you accept your alliance with Marxism? And so the first answer to that might be the optimistic one, which is that the postmodernists and the radicals who are driving the politically correct movement are actually sincere in their desire to help the oppressed. And so we could say, having established the fact that there's an absolute plethora of interpretations, and dispensing with the notion that any of those are canonical or valued above any others, we can still act like decent human beings and try to take care of people who are less fortunate than us. Now, as an intellectual argument, that's a really bad one, because you don't get to have the first proposition and the second proposition simultaneously, but I would also say that respect for coherence and logic is not the strong suit of postmodernists, and that's actually a technical part of their theory. So, but the problem with that theory, as far as I can tell, and this actually happens to be a big problem, was that by the late, late 1960s, even French intellectuals as boneheaded as Jean-Paul Sartre finally had to agree that the evidence, what, pouring in from places like the Maoist China and, Stella, and St the Stalinist Soviet Union, or the post-Stalinist Soviet Union, were revealing abhorrent political practices on such an, at such an at such a level of magnitude and undeniability that even a French intellectual had to admit that there was something wrong. And so by the end of the 1960s, it became impossible to simultaneously claim that you actually had concern for the oppressed, or even for the oppressor for that matter, and also claim that you would abide by the tenets of Marxism as a functional economic and political doctrine. No one would do that, and I think the, the, the cap was put on that by Alexander Solzhenitsyn in the mid-70s. So I don't buy the postmodern argument that it's compassion that's driving the postmodern alliance with Marxism. I don't buy that a bit, because I think that if, these, if, if the postmodernists were compassionate, and they were using that as the default aim in their life, let's say, because they don't have any other aim because of their postmodern relativism, you'd have to accept the compassion idea, but because they're ignoring the historical reality that the doctrines that they're trying to put into practice were murderous beyond belief, then I can't accept the argument that it's compassion that's driving it. So, it's wrong that way, too. And then the next thing is that... So what's the alternative, I guess? What's the alternative? Well, Nietzsche, interestingly enough, I think figured out the alternative almost how long is it now? More than 150 years ago now. It was pretty damn amazing, you know, he was an amazing thinker. Nietzsche knew, for example, and he wrote about this in his notebooks in Will to Power, that the nihilistic doctrines that would emerge in the, in, in the aftermath of the demolition of the 
theological and philosophical substructure of the West that he associated with the revelation of the death of God would produce a form of political catastrophe and he identified it specifically, believe it or not, with communism and that was back in like 1850, 1860, I can't believe he did it and that that would kill tens to hundreds of millions of people in the 20th century now Nietzsche also said, well maybe that wouldn't be too, hard, too high a price to pay if we actually learned something from it but it isn't obvious that we have and it's certainly not obvious that the postmodernists that, that uh, let's say infest the modern universities have been willing to learn anything at all from 20th century history not least the lesson that the egalitarian and equal, equity oriented doctrines that they're attempting to foist upon young people in, in, in this cult-like educational manner are anything but murderous anyways, here's what Nietzsche said he could really turn a phrase, man. For that man be delivered from revenge, that is for me the bridge to the highest hope, and a rainbow after long storms. The tarantulas, of course, would have it otherwise. Quote, what justice means to us is precisely that the world will be filled with the storms of our revenge. End quote. Thus they speak to each other. We shall wreak vengeance and abuse on all whose equals we are not. Thus do the tarantula hearts vow. And will to equality shall henceforth be the name for virtue. And against all that has power, we want to raise our clamor. You preachers of equality, the tyrant mania of impotence clamors thus out of you for equality. Your most secret ambition is to be tyrants and shroud themselves, shroud yourselves in words of virtue. Well, you know, that's a pretty major criticism. And it's one that, to me, actually explains the paradoxical, the perverse paradoxes that sit at the bottom of the otherwise ununderstandable union between the postmodernists and the Marxists. So you lay out the argument again like this. The postmodernists have it that there are no canonical interpretations of the world. I already told you why that's a foolish, a foolish stance in my estimation. But even assuming it's true, then what that would mean is that you don't get to ally yourself with doctrines such as Marxism. But of course the postmodernists do. And so what that means is because you can't come up with a logical explanation for that let's call it unholy union, you have to look elsewhere for an explanation. But you can't look to compassion itself, which is the explanation that's offered, because the doctrines that are being promoted to be implemented in the service of mankind have demonstrated themselves, as few other doctrines ever have, as murderous and tyrannical beyond belief. So you don't get that. So then what? What's left over? Well, here's another thing that's interesting about the postmodernists. In their world, there's nothing but power, right? Nothing exists but power. And so the landscape for the postmodernists is that the world is a sequence of pyramids of hierarchies of power, all of them equally unjust and unreliable, let's say, because there's an infinite number of interpretations, and all that is establishing the relationship within those hierarchies and between those hierarchies is power. Now, you know, obviously that's a conclusion that is cynical beyond comprehension and reprehensible beyond belief, not least because it's so, it, it reduces a very complex reality to a very simple, simple, single cause. But it also, the thing is, I've been trying to figure out why this emphasis on power above all else. Well, you think, well, the basic claim of, of an infinite number of interpretations is incorrect. There's no logical reason for the relationship between postmodernism and Marxism, there's no logical reason to believe on the face of the evidence that that's driven by compassion. It's allied with this sense that nothing exists but power. Well, that has me turn to Nietzsche's explanation for resentment. It's what's driving the entire enterprise is the fact that people in the academy, let's say, intellectuals in the academy, look out at the world and they notice that there are others who are respected perhaps more than they are, and there are others that have perhaps more than they are, and that goods are inequitably distributed beyond them. And the consequence of that is the emergence of the tremendous resentment that Nietzsche spoke of. The desire of that resentment is to pull down the hierarchies by criticizing them. That's the motivation for positing the uh, infinite number of potential 
interpretations, because if there's an infinite number of potential interpretations and your interpretation privileges you to a per particular position of power and I can undermine the, your claim to the validity of that interpretation, then I can logically demolish your claim that you deserve whatever power, authority, privilege, etc. goes along with that position. While the other, it also allows me to usurp it, it allows me to use it for my own purposes, it allows me to take power and control. And since the postmodernists have already claimed that all that exists is power, why should we assume that there is anything whatsoever that motivates them, especially given the other incoherent paradoxes that are, that are a part and parcel of the doctrine and its alliance with Marxism, why should we assume that it is anything at all other than the naked will to power that motivates and activates the doctrine? Well, that's what I've been thinking about for like intensely, more intensely than usual, for about the last eight months. You know, and I've got it boiled down to something approximating 15 minutes, which is a bit short, a bit short, <laughs> a bit, a period of time that's a bit short to deal with such things, but I would certainly at least invite you to think about it, because I don't see that, I haven't been able to figure out any way out of the logical argument that I just presented to you. And if that argument is correct, then that's a diagnosis for why what's happening in the political correct world, and actually what its motivations are, and I believe that my argument is, it's accurate, it's accurate, and it's destroying the universities, and it's invading the rest of our society, and the idea that there's something good behind it, that's a dangerous idea. I don't think so. I think what's behind it is exactly what Nietzsche noted 150 years ago. It's resentment, and the demand for power, disguising itself most reprehensibly as compassion, and it's time for the mask of that to be taken off and things set straight before we walk further down a path that will lead to no good than we've already walked down. for some spool of thread. What a dangerous thought you expressed there, little sister. They want to teach you a lesson for the rest of your life. Fire, fire. We fought the war. And we looked into the bonfires to see what kind of victory it would be. The wind wafted a glowing husk from the bonfire. To that flame in you, girl, I promise the whole wide world will read about you. transform their tragedy into a love story that's it okay. you know yeah and it's the whole journaling experience that is our product and our um our service is to save to sh to help them share to other people that they can make uh friends with online and maybe even do it offline if they want to create their own journaling groups as a volunteership you know pay it mm -hmm. forward um, and then structure their journal entries into eventually a 13 chapter love story journal. And the public buys a journal. They have the app that will then show the video. But if there was a way for them to like online chat with us, if they needed help or if they needed, because I know that we've talked about the, the journaling techniques and how to implement those and how to put those in the same format. But if I'm just forecasting in the future, if there's someone that is in the universe and they're going through the journal and they don't know where to start, is there any ability for them to communicate with us on a real time? You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. And how, how, like, how would that look for our team? Would our team then 
we have dedicated people to be able to help walk through or listen to someone's story because sometimes it's easier for people to talk about their story before they write it down or talk out their thoughts and then write it down. So I just don't know if that's even like a possibility. And that's, that was kind of what popped into my head when we were talking about that right now. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. And I think um, act one, the journal program is um, definitely something I foresee, you know, um, our staff members, uh, being available digitally. However, we got to work out the, um, the membership and, and also um, our time and our pay that goes with yeah. it. Uh, let's see. I'm ex Hello? Dang. I paused again. Hello? Just briefly go over this uh let's see if i have that Can that's that's quarter two right april 1st yes that's quarter cool. two we're going to start that playbook and that's going to be the real time board that's right got to go to the real time or you could go to my doc it's right on the bottom that might be nice to look at oh yeah 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 definitely um, sure the, don't mind the dates guys these are wrong but it's going to in the same timeline uh, of the spacing, but just starting April 1st. Thank you so much. Uh, so the first, so it's, it's, we go in honor of 13, right? Like 13 verses of love. We're doing 13 by 13 by 13. So how that works is in 13 weeks, we're going to have 13 producers from different parts of the world producing their short doc interviews and submitting it to produce the love story journal volume three and onwards and then 13 showcase producers that's going to pair with the the storytelling producers to put on the show on the 13th no we didn't we said 14th week um but that's another story because we have to on the 13th week we're going to have the books physically in everyone's hands. On the 13th week, um, we would have successfully crowdfunded a thousand journals uh, digitally everywhere, somewhere into the, into the world. And uh, we also have the copyright done, the publishing setup done, so that it's um, on Barnes & Nobles ready to be picked up digitally you know now they have print on demand it's very easy to get these distributed worldwide um okay so uh in 13 ambassadors i believe i'm going to talk to annalyn about that annalyn is our digital producer uh we're already starting a journaling pilot this is to like how do we actually engage with the content we're producing that's what we're piloting and we're going to see if we could get 13 college or high school college and high school ambassadors to start their own journaling circles so this is kind of where that space is so they're going to feel anxious about it um there's gonna there's a whole website with Stephen Pressfield about the war of art and talks about the resistance and that's going to be very normal so just letting people know when you first onboard them as ambassadors, like what are some uh, expectations, what are some normal um, processes they'll experience when they do this pilot um, and how that this experience of fear and anxiety and resistance is actually very normal. So not to make it wrong. Um, they're going to experience writer's block. I know I've, gotten anxious I've, I've had to like cancel certain plans after my journaling because i just was so drained so drained yeah. after yep. that, you know um so Absolutely. just like, yeah, letting people know about that uh, but it's all soul work right it's all soul work and soul work yeah. is so heavy and it's not even a bad heavy right when you're looking at who you are and you're trying like i just had a conversation with a good friend about when you me personally 
as a as a younger person when i got angry it wasn't because i was angry it's because i was scared mm -hmm. right and that's not necessarily a healthy defense mechanism right i can't teach my daughter that i need to teach my daughter how to own her feelings that's hard work it's hard work to identify what you're feeling and how to appropriately express those feelings mm -hmm. right it's safe to express anger out of fear mm -hmm. that's a safe way to handle your fear it's not a healthy way to handle your fear right when you're doing this kind of work that you're peeling back those layers so you can identify on the surface i feel angry but as i'm writing as i'm journaling as i'm learning about myself I'm not angry, I'm scared, right? And these are, I think that a lot of times, especially the people that we're onboarding right now, they're confident writers. They have a lot of experience doing exactly what you said, journalistic writing, right? Factual-based writing. Their audience is the general public, right? But when your audience is you or other people who are experiencing hard things, you have to tailor your writing to the audience, right? And if the audience is you, absolutely, it's hard, draining work. But yeah. I mean, it's it's quality work that is that's important. It's so important. And since I'm not planning to let anyone else read this stiff back notebook, grandly referred to as a diary. Unless I should ever find a real friend, it probably won't make a bit of a difference. Now I'm back to the point that prompted me to keep a diary in the first place. I don't have a friend. Let me put it more clearly since no one will believe that a 13 year old girl is completely alone in the world. And I'm not. I have loving parents and a 16 year old sister. And there are about 30 people I can call friends. I have a bond of admirers can't keep their adoring eyes off me and who sometimes have to resort to using a broken pocket mirror to try and catch a glimpse of me in the classroom.